While our panelists take their seats, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. My name is Paul Fogelin. I'm the president of the Empire Club of Canada. And uh, welcome to our 113th season. Uh, this is the third evening event we've ever held in the club's history. And I just want to thank very briefly uh, Gord McGuire. Where's Gord? Give him a round of applause. Gord, Mc well deserved. So Gord, Gord McGuire is uh, on our board and he uh, co-chairs our evening events committee along with Amber Canwar who couldn't be with us tonight. She's not feeling well, unfortunately. And uh, they've done tremendous work to put together these, uh, these sorts of events. We're traditionally a lunch club. We've been doing it since 1903. But we decided it'd be great to start to do events in the evening. Not everybody could take two hours off in the middle of the day to talk about and come hear people talk about the issues of the day. So uh, this is a new thing and we're thrilled to have a great turnout tonight. And particularly for this subject matter. Does anybody care about housing? few people. No. Nobody. So the, so the title of tonight's event is How to Survive Canada's Housing Market. It's pretty dire. And before we get started in uh, uh, the panel tonight, uh, we have a prize draw. Uh, and do I get to pull it now? Fantastic. Okay. So Adamo C. Palumo. Congrats. The last guy to show up. You get a bottle of wine from Ripasso Bosan, sponsored by Cesare Fine Wines of Verona. Enjoy. It's good wine. I made sure to try it before we accepted it as our sponsor gift. So um, I'm going to invite Derek, Sarah from RBC uh, Mortgages to give the formal introduction of our panelists. But before we do, uh, let's just reflect that Toronto is actually number one. And unfortunately, it doesn't mean our sports teams. It's in housing prices. And we all know that uh, Toronto has actually uh, had the fastest rise in housing prices of any country in any city in the world last year. And so this is um, tremendous for economic growth. It's very exciting for anybody who owns property. It's exciting for people who can enter the market. But it creates a tremendous sense of unease and a massive burden for people, especially young people, who feel like they can't enter the market. So as we know, uh, this housing hysteria led the provincial government to enact what they're calling the Fair Housing Plan, which I'm sure we're going to get some feedback and reaction to tonight from our panelists. Um, but who knows if it'll make a difference? Who knows what's going to keep happening? I think these gentlemen will have a better sense than anybody else, so we're thrilled to have them uh, with us tonight. So I'd like to invite Derek Serra to provide uh, the formal introductions of our guests. Thanks, Paul. And it's nice to be here and nice to be uh, representing RBC here tonight. And again, I've, I've, we've been kind of on a circuit in talking about mortgages, um, more so than ever before. And my, my line has always been lately, other than Donald Trump, all people want to talk about is the value of their home uh, and, and how their mortgage will fit into that kind of perspective and buying and selling and all those kind of great things. And so at RBC, we have a fantastic team uh, across GTR uh, in terms of our sales force and certainly we have a few of them in the room you'll spot them out they all look like bankers those are in fact bankers that are around you tonight and uh, and so anyway I'm sure that this will be a great conversation and one that we're really proud to sponsor and so thanks to the Empire Club for joining us so on our panel this evening we have Alex Avery the managing director and institutional equity research individual for global markets at CABC Capital Markets so Alex And John Pasalis, founder and president of Real Osophy. So, John. And Jeff Rubin, economist and author of The End of Growth. And we have our moderator, which would be left with Greg, Greg Bonnell. And Greg is the real estate reporter and anchor for BNN. And so, gentlemen, over to you uh, and look forward to the discussion tonight. So, thanks and thanks, Paul. You can tell by the way that they're elevated higher than me, that they have the big ideas, and I'm the reporter, so I'm just going to keep them in line in case they get rough. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I've been doing real estate for BNN for almost three years now. When I first started on the beat, uh, the fallback phrase when I went on TV was the three hot markets, Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto. We know what happened to Calgary, and now we know what happened to Vancouver. And it seems silly now that three years ago I would have been using language like hot because we were nowhere near 33% price growth year over year. So as we discuss tonight how to survive Canada's housing markets and governments try to figure out how to fix them, whether they can or not, I think it's sort of important to start the discussion about what got us here in the first place so, so we can help navigate it. So I think I'm just going to go down the panel, get quick ideas from everyone on why they think 
house prices in Toronto got pushed to this level because everyone I talked to has a different theory as to that as well. So we'll start with Alex and move our way down. Sure. So um, I'm, I'm uh, by day I analyze commercial REITs, um, including apartment REITs, but uh, a lot of shopping centers and office buildings and industrial buildings and things like that. And uh, you know I've been doing that for about 15 years. And about, uh, I would say maybe a dozen years ago, I started to notice that uh, a lot of the conversations that I was having with people when I told them I was a real estate analyst uh, immediately went to, is it a good time to buy a house? And uh, that was sort of, I think, you know, the, the early stages of uh, the euphoria that uh, I think has gripped the Canadian housing market. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, started, uh, I guess, writing down some of the experiences that I had and figured out that, um, you know, uh, there were a lot of misconceptions that Canadians had about housing. Uh, they didn't really um, understand the, um, you know, the, the financial investments, the lifestyle impacts that they were making when they were buying houses. Uh, I, I published a book earlier, uh, just in the fall, uh, called The Wealthy Renter, uh, and the objective of that book was really twofold. One uh, was to uh, highlight the merits and the appeal of renting in a uh, home ownership crazed environment. Uh, no one really stands up and says, you know, you're smart if you rent or, you know, there's a lot of appeal to renting. And uh, I found that uh, particularly a lot of young people in their 20s and early 30s felt a lot of pressure to buy homes uh, when you have housing that's moving up at 33 uh, percent at record price to income, when you've got record low interest rates, record high personal indebtedness. Uh, that's not a recipe for success, and so uh, I thought it was important to balance out um, that, you know, that uh, that understanding of home ownership versus rental. And then the second thing was, you know, more broadly, even for people who uh, do choose home ownership, I, I am a homeowner myself, uh, to better understand it and get educated on the topic before, um, you know, before they make the plunge. One of the uh, big themes in my book is is really about government and. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the housing market, it's no more of a market than the Canadian dairy industry. Uh, the government is, you know, coach, referee, cheerleader, and fan in the game of housing. Uh, they determine all aspects of it, uh, of the housing market. Um, you know, everything from zoning and permits to property taxes, development charges, uh, land transfer tax, you can take money out of your RSP, you don't have to pay capital gains. I mean, when you actually take a look at the housing market, it's almost entirely dictated by the policy that government puts forward towards, you know, regulating the housing market. And so when, you know, when you ask what's going on in the Canadian housing market, I would point firmly to uh, policy mistakes that have been made over uh, the last 15, 20 years. And uh, most notably, they would be the Green Belt and the Places to Grow Acts. Uh, those are, I think, you know, almost singularly responsible for, uh, you know, the, the current state that we're in. Lots of other things have had big factors like, uh, you know, I think uh, low interest rates are just like gas on a, on a fire. But, uh, but I would say that policy is really what has got us to this point. And uh, so I would lay this whole problem at the feet of government. All right, Jeff. What do you think, Jeff? <coughs> Hi, just to introduce myself, my name's Jeff Rubin. Uh, for 20 years, I was the chief economist at CIBC World Markets. I left in 2009 to become an author. I started my career back in 1988, putting out a call for a 25% correction in housing prices, uh, which at the time uh, was quite controversial. Um, in the report, when I was looking at it this morning, there are many similarities with today's condition, and there are many differences. Um, you know, the report marked you know, the decline in affordability, speculation, uh, potential inflationary transmission from housing prices to the real economy. But that's not really why I made the call. Um, I made the call not about housing prices at all. I made the call about interest rates. We had a zealot in the Bank of Canada. He was on an anti-inflationary crusade. And unlike most people, or at least my, the other chief economists on Bay Street, I believed him. Housing bubbles, I mean, a bubble existed all the time. Uh, Toronto's housing market was egregiously overvalued for at least three years before it crashed in 89. And if you want to talk about price increases, uh, you mentioned a 33% increase this year. 
Well, in the space of 86 to 89, Toronto housing prices doubled. So that would mean three consecutive years of 33% increase. Actually, you young guys haven't seen anything. <laughs> well, so what, what I'm saying is the market could have crashed at any time in the interim uh, training period. Uh, what pricked the bubble, of course, was interest rates. Do you know what interest rates were when I made that call in 1989? A 91-day Treasury bill in Canada was 12.2%. A long Canada bond was 9.65%. We had a hugely inverted yield curve. E inverted yield curves means the bond market is already discounting a recession and hence future cuts in short-term interest rates. How did we get? to 250 basis point inversion of the yield curve. Well, because Canadian short-term interest rates, under the guidance of Governor Crow in his crusade against inflation, was no less than 250 basis points above the federal funds rate, which was at the time about 9.5%. So really, it wasn't a call about affordability. It wasn't a call about speculation. It was a call about the cost to carry because real estate corrections are ultimately about the cost to carry. And that was also true in 2007, 2008, where we had Fed tightening and the resets on the subprime mortgage rates. Without that Fed tightening, without the resets, who would know where U.S. property values and mortgage-backed securities would be? What, what are the circumstances today? For all of Governor Polos's pontifications about household debt levels, unsustainable mortgage uh, debt, the fact of the matter is that he's ruled out any rate increases, and indeed, there's probably about a 50% chance still that the next move from the Bank of Canada is a cut. And while the Ontario government was unveiling its grandiose plan of 16 different points to rein in housing demand from vacancy tax to spe foreign speculator taxes, as if only foreigners speculate and domestic owners don't, Guess what? Five-year mortgage rates fell about 20 basis points because of a curve-flattening rally in the U.S. bond market. If I had to net-net, I'll put my money on the impact of the 20 basis point decline in five-year mortgage rates. That not, that's not to say that a bubble can't be pricked. That's not to say that Toronto's real estate prices aren't overvalued. But what it is to say is there's no context today to prick that bubble. And until there is a context, overvalued as it might seem, real estate demand and real estate prices have only one direction to go, and that's up. Later on in tonight's discussion, I'll point out what could change that world, but really the key here is borrowing rates and what's going to happen to them over the next 24 months. No one here is concerned about a plateau in housing prices. Why people came here today is they're concerned about a crash. The gun is loaded, but there's nothing to pull the trigger. All right, so we know where Jeff stands on the issue pretty clearly. Uh, John, obviously you have, a, you have a different perspective, an interesting one. I saw one of your tweets today that really intrigued me about uh, the psychology of the herd. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, before we get to that, I mean, that's kind of what's going on right now. Um, you know, Toronto's real estate market's really interesting. I mean, I think for about 15 years up to the start of 2016, uh, you know, I'd say Toronto's market was pretty normal. And, uh, you know, even though most people and a lot of people were talking about a crash because prices were going up 5 to 10% a year, it was a sustained boom, it was irrational, you know, you kind of read this in the press, it, it made complete sense. And Toronto's boom for 15 years, like the story about it, you know, is told very well by a few economists, two from Wharton and, and one from Columbia, who wrote this paper called Superstar Cities. And, and what they found was, and what they highlighted was, international cities like Toronto that are 
uh, attractive for foreign capital and, and, and in particular immigration and that are constrained by supply, what eventually starts happening is prices start disconnecting from incomes, okay? Because you have a ton of capital coming in that's not local and this starts driving up prices at a faster rate. On top of that, you have supply constraints. So this is, you know, this is what we see in cities like San Francisco and New York, and, and now Toronto. So it seemed irrational because prices were going up so much, but it, it kind of made sense. The, the kind of the, the line where things changed was in 2016. And in 2016, you know, and we see this, I mean, one of the fun things about being in, in the real estate space is you see things at the ground level, you know, and before it's in the press, before any economist is, is in their spreadsheets, you see how people behave. And in 2016, I would say at the beginning of the year, probably 50% of the people that were contacting us wanted to buy a house as an investment. That was it. They just want to buy it. And most of them were domestic. I'd say uh, our, our clientele is primarily domestic. Everyone wanted a house. And when people were contacting us, they didn't want a triplex or a duplex or a fourplex. They wanted a single family home. You know, and we did the math and said, listen, you can buy a single family home, but you know, when you do the math, you're probably losing 1,500 bucks a month. Everyone's answer was the same. It was like, I don't care. Why do I care about losing 15? It's going to go up 10, worst case, 10% a year, probably 20 by next year, right? So, you know, I mean, anyone who studies history and, and economics knows this is not normal behavior. Um, you know, and this kind of alarmed us a little bit. So we actually started looking at the data. That's one of the things that our company does is we try to find what's going on in the data. Uh, and we published a report last month where we basically looked at every single sale in the GTA from 2014 to 2016. And we said, okay, let's look at all of these sales and let's figure out what percentage of the homes that sold were rented out immediately after the buyer took possession. Uh, and we were able to do this because we had the MLS sales data and we had the MLS lease data, right? So this is just MLS leases. And you know, in 2016, the percentage of investors kind of skyrocketed. In, 20, in, in, in particular, in the 905, in areas like Aurora and Newmarket, in 2012, maybe 5% of homes were being sold to investors. And in 2016, 20% of homes were being sold to investors. And because we had all of the data in terms of what each investor paid for the house, what their taxes were, what they're getting for rent, it's not hard to calculate if they're making money or if they're losing money using some very basic assumptions. And we just assume they put down 35%, which is pretty generous. And 95% of these properties are cash flow negative. They're losing money. And on average, they're losing 1,300 bucks, I think it was. So, you know, what's happened in 2016 is kind of when, I mean, at least what I'm seeing is sort of when this investor psychology kind of kicked in, this, this idea that, and both from buyers and from investors. From buyers, it's this feeling like, if I don't buy a house now, I'm never getting in. And I gotta pay whatever price my agent tells me. And on the investors, the psychology was, well, why don't I just take out 200 grand home line of credit, put it down on a property, it's gonna make 20% a year. I mean, you're gonna, not gonna find a safer and more secure investment than that. And, and that's really what kind of pushed prices, I think, through the roof uh, in 2016 and in the start of 2017. So, I mean, and, and to Greg's kind of point about, I tweeted today about how I find this psychology of housing markets insanely fascinating because if you looked at how people were talking two months ago, two months ago, everyone was looking at buying a house. The psychology was, if I don't buy a house now, I'm done. Like, I will not be able to buy one. And this is how people were talking. You know, you'd see them in, in sales offices, 20 offers on houses people paying 10 to 20% more than homes were worth, like just completely irrational prices. And in the past four weeks, it's completely changed. And it's changed for a couple of reasons. A, new listings kind of went through the roof. So over the past four weeks, you know, the number of properties for sale is up like 50 to 60% over last year, okay, which is an insanely high number. And on top of that, you have more listings, and then all of a sudden you have buyers kind of holding back, thinking, well, what's the government going to do? Is this going to impact the market? Is, is kind of what happened to Vancouver going to happen to Toronto? So in four weeks, we went from this you know, panic buying to everybody kind of stepping back. And houses now 
on their offer nights are getting no offers, or they're getting one offer, or, you know, and, and it's a complete shift, and it's really fascinating how, you know, things can kind of just turn in four weeks. Okay, so we know we got cheap money. We know we have domestic speculators, even though everyone wanted to point their finger at the, the foreign boogeyman for the longest time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Ottawa. I sat down with Governor Polaz. He said he can't stop. The rates are an ineffective tool for stopping the speculators. He actually said to me if he raised rates by 5%, you wouldn't stop the speculators expecting a 30% return. Uh, I asked Bill Morneau if he was going to do something about capital gains. He said no. And uh, then the Ontario government comes out with his rules. And as much as Charles Seuss, the finance minister, has been beating the drum about the domestic speculator, they didn't really go after them. I mean, have, has the government, you, Alex, you talked about the fact that you can lay it all at their feet because of the policy we've had. He come, they come out with 16 points to fix it. And did they fix anything? Two days before they made those announcements, uh, they made a, a solemn vow, uh, the three of them, Morneau, um, Susa and John Tory, and they said, uh, whatever we do, we won't do anything to uh, increase prices, yeah. like, you know, yeah. subsidize first-time no or... And then they introduced rent controls that will stifle the new supply of rental housing. I mean, that is exactly what they said they would not do two days earlier. Um, I don't think anything that, uh, that they've put forward will really have much of an impact. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I, you know, I tend to agree with Jeff that I don't see, you know, the gun is loaded. I don't see anything... Uh, in the near term that is likely to slow down this market. Um, the policy mistakes that were made were made 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, um, you know, they should have been better thought out. Uh, even we were talking earlier, uh, you know, the, the policy announcements that were made last week were uh, behind the scenes being made up until hours before the announcements came out. I mean, this is not well thought out. And that's one of the most dangerous things about housing policy is that it is so seductive to politicians to use it for political gain rather than in efforts to, you know, promote a healthy housing market. And, you know, the people who are making the decisions aren't, you know, educated about the housing market. They don't understand and they don't appreciate the magnitude of the impact that it can have. I mean, um, you know, house prices are now extraordinarily expensive. And it's, you know, I, I feel bad for people who are, you know, just starting out in a city like Toronto or in Vancouver where you feel the pressure to get in. And, you know, you're, the stakes are very, very high. If you make a, a bad buy right at the top, you could be paying for it for decades and it could ruin your retirement. Or if you don't get into the market and it goes up another 50%, you're left behind. I mean, that's not, neither of those are good choices. And even the third choice of just a flat housing market is also bad because then you're going to live house poor for the next 25 years as you try and pay off that mortgage. I mean, it should have never been allowed to get to the, the, the spot that it's at today. And uh, I, I don't see really any near-term solutions for it. So, you know, my, my recommendation when people ask is um, definitely don't do it as an investment uh, in terms of buying a house. Consider renting and, uh, you know, whatever you do, protect your downside because this is an elevated risk environment. I want to ask Jeff, uh, given your knowledge, going back through certain bank governors, why is Governor Polaz so unwilling to raise rates? The way I put the question to him, I said, we're at half a percent. Go up to uh, three quarters. Go up to, you know, one percent. What would be the big deal? And, and he said he, he can't said, do it. He said he can't do it. Five percent wouldn't even change it. He said five percent yeah. wouldn't quell the speculators. What absolute utter nonsense. Okay? <laughs> absolute BS. I should have had you okay? in the room with me. I would have. <laughs> half of that would not only get rid of the speculators, it would deflate the whole market. <laughs> Foreign speculators, domestic speculators, and non-speculators would all see a massive devaluation in their property values that would have ramifications on lending institutions and the economy as a well. whole. So let's understand why Governor Polos is correct in not wanting to address the market. Not because he couldn't, but because the consequences of that would dwarf the benefits. You know, the first thing you would have is an utter deflation in housing market prices. In 1989, it was about 25%. Took down about half of the trust companies at the time, if I recall. Olympia and York was funding Canary Wharf at the front end of the Canadian yield curve. So there's a very good reason why one. And then there would be 
collateral damage to financial institutions. We've already seen an Alte a lender lose about 65% of its yeah. share own, value. Own in the capital last today. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, you know, that's just uh, a warm up to what would lie ahead. And it wouldn't be just limited to the Alte and subprime market. And lastly, what were the macroeconomic consequences of the 1989 90 uh, housing market crash? They were a deep recession. So this would be a policy mandated recession. Lastly, by within its own terms of reference, and ultimately the Bank of Canada's primary mandate, as the primary mandate of all central banks, is price stability. There is not an argument to move interest rates. Inflation is barely at the 2% target. And unlike 89.90, no evidence of acid inflation spilling over to general inflation. So while I disagree vehemently <laughs> with Governor Polo's assessment that even 5% would not get rid of the speculators, I would ultimately you know, acknowledge that he is right in not sacrificing the Canadian economy collateral damage to financial institutions, and a hard landing for property values just to quell inflation. Hopefully, we'll discuss a bit later, the interest rate risk does not just lie with what the Bank of Canada does. There are some fundamental changes in Washington that can fundamentally change the picture, and certainly, the Toronto housing market would be collateral damage from those changes. All right, let's get to that right now then. We'll go to John because obviously what we're talking about is not what Governor Pulas can control, which is just the overnight rate in Canada. The bond market, five-year yields dictate obviously five-year mortgages. When Donald Trump surprised the world and took the office, they jumped up. They sort of leveled out in a bit, but we could see further moves higher. Uh, is that what undoes the market from your point of view, John, when you, you take a look at uh, the, the cost of borrowing? I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think uh, it's going to go up in any meaningful way to kind of curb demand. You know, we have a lot of, I mean, rates would have to go up quite significantly to kind of cool investor demand. Uh, and I, I, think, I don't think anyone sees that happening anytime soon. I think most of us were expecting, you know, kind of public policy to kind of prick this thing and cool it down. And I think the cool down we're seeing now is, I think in Toronto it's going to be temporary. I think it's psychological. I don't think there's anything that has happened. Uh, I think people are just kind of hitting pause. Uh, and in three months when they realize, well, there's nothing really that's changed, everyone's going to jump back in. We're going to have 20 offers on houses again. So uh, I don't think that's going to cool anything down. Sure, I'm starting to hear the same, same about Vancouver, too, that they're, they, yeah, they're, were, they were scared, and now they're just going to get back in, and everything's going to go nuts there, too. When we're talking Donald Trump, we're talking about cutting corporate income tax from 35 to 15 percent. We're talking about a 15 billion dollar increase in defense spending, not to mention the billion dollars of infrastructure, not just the wall against Mexico, but you know an infrastructure project spending in line with you know the highway projects that that Eisenhower did in the 1950s, okay? So we're talking about, you know, a double, you know, a huge increase in US deficits that are funded in the US Treasury market, quite apart from what the Federal Reserve Board does. So, I mean, I think there already is a significant risk if in fact that's the fiscal direction taken. The greatest risk, the greatest risk, and this is a game changer, is if we bring back all those jobs from Mexico and China, guess what? The price of everything is going up. I mean, the grand bargain of globalization is higher profits and lower consumer prices traded off for local production and employment. And NAFTA is a perfect example of that. If Donald Trump goes ahead and imposes, forget about the 20% duty on softwood lumber, that's been going on for a long time and it's a sideshow. But if he goes ahead and imposes a 35% tariff against Mexico and a 45% tariff against China, that's a game changer for inflation. And this is bigger than just Donald Trump. Okay, Bernie Sanders from the Democrats was arguing the same kind of thing. 
that trade deals have screwed US workers. And if you look over at Brexit, that was the same vote. And uh, Marine Le Pen in France, she's talking about taking France out of the EU and, and you know, reversing globalization. These are game-changing events. And, you know, they inherently involve distributional questions. I mean, they inherently involve, you know, the loss of the middle class, the d reduction in real wages. But the quid pro quo here for getting that production back is higher prices, higher inflation. Higher inflation will be addressed by both the monetary authorities and by the bond market. And therein lies the challenge, because while Governor Polos is not going to just slam on the brakes like Governor Crow did back in 1989, I would say from the two to five year part of the mortgages is, is about the bond market. And that's really going to be about just how far does Donald Trump go in following through on the things that he's promised. Can't have four houses in your TV if each one costs three grand. Excellent. I made that point on TV <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to put Alex on the spot because we want to talk about surviving this real estate market. I find the hardest thing to convince someone is that uh, they shouldn't buy. You wrote a book about why you should rent. And not only why you should rent, how you can become a wealthy renter. So convince these people, maybe some of them are looking to buy, don't buy a house. Rent a house. You know, I, uh, I, I wrote the book, and that's the message, uh, you know, when you look at the front cover. Uh, but th I think the message really is a little bit more. It's uh, housing is like prescription medicine. Uh, everyone has their own prescription, and that prescription can change based on the person, but also an individual person over time. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you need to consider. Um, but uh, I think, you know, outside of your own personal circumstances, when you're looking at a market that is at record highs, uh, you know, record indebtedness, record low interest rates. Uh, that's a good time to take pause and say, you know, uh, what is this the equivalent of? If, if I'm your financial advisor and I come to you and I say, like, listen, Greg, I've got a great plan. Let's take five times your net worth. We'll put it into a single stock that's trading at the highest price it's ever been, the highest PE it's ever been, and everyone in the market is levered to the roof. Um, the transaction costs will be about 10%. And uh, okay. the market is totally illiquid. And you're going to hold it for 25 years. Let's hope. I say, put me in it, Alex. That sounds put like a fabulous, it. fabulous personal financial plan. Um, but uh, you know, that's not to say that the market is going to go down. It's just that um, if you aren't really appreciated, I mean, if you say that to someone, say, go to, go to anyone you know and say, like, listen, you've got uh, $50,000 worth of savings. Why don't you go out and borrow another 50000 and buy some bank stock, which in Canada is a regulated oligopoly, a pretty safe bet. Almost no one is going to take you up on that. But if they say you've got $50,000, let's go out and borrow $950,000, 20 times that amount, and buy a house, that's going to cost you a lot of money every month instead of paying you a dividend. That seems to be very popular. But that's, you know, that, that goes back to, I mean, the... the uh, I think I'm going to sell my house. <laughs> well, I, I, I own a house. Um, there are lots of good reasons to do it, but uh, uh, fear of missing out is not a good reason to get into the market. And, uh, and I do think that there are some challenges. I, I disagree with Jeff a little bit on the interest rates or the importance of interest rates. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've found is really bizarre about housing and, uh, and you know, the whole economist view that uh, you know, affordability is important. Affordability really isn't important, which is kind of a, a hard thing to wrap your head around. Uh, people don't buy houses because they can afford them. They buy them because they want them. Uh, I went down to, uh, to Manhattan about uh, six, seven years ago, and uh, we had a woman who was working on the desk. She was about 26 years old, uh, had a bunch of meetings during the day. We went out for a drink at night, and I said, you know, you moved down from Toronto nine months ago. How's it going? She's like, oh, New York is fabulous. I absolutely love it. Uh, I said, you know, so where are you living? She's like, oh, the Upper West Side. I'm like, oh, how much are they paying you? Uh, and, uh, and then I said, how big is your apartment? Because it's you know, notoriously small apartments. And she said it's 800 square feet. And in New York terms, that's a palace. And uh, she saw the shocked look on my face. And, uh, and then she said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I have three roommates. And I was like, you have a boyfriend and you know, another couple? No, no, no. Uh, three, uh, four separate people living in an 800 square foot apartment with one bathroom. Uh, that's a perfect example of a housing market where the price of housing is 
uh, not dictated by what people can afford, but by the amount of people who want to work there. Uh, you know, I would say in the case of the Toronto crash, uh, which Jeff uh, correctly called ahead of time, which uh, almost no one did, or perhaps no one but Jeff did, uh, I would say that employment was another big factor in that one, in addition to uh, interest rate changes. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that could be. I mean, if we were to see a material change in employment, uh, I think higher interest rates would probably coincide with that uh, in the sense that, you know, Polos can't, well, I mean, the, the interest rates can't really go up. The, uh, the economy is over indebted too much. All right, I'm going to put this question to all three uh, panel members. I want to start with John, though. I asked the finance minister last week, because they all agree, the politicians, any economists, 33% doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. It's not a healthy growth in home prices. So I said, what's the number? Like, if you're trying to cool the market, if you're trying to bring stability back to the market, give me a number. Whether he didn't have the number or whether he didn't want to share the number with me, he decided, well, I'm not going to put a number on it. I did some research, TD Bank put a, at least an average on it a couple of years ago. In your mind, and I'm going to start with John, what do you think in a healthy market like Toronto, what should we expect annually in terms of price increases where you'd say, that's okay, we're cool with that? Well, I mean, I think everything we've had up to 2016, which kind of fluctuated between 3% to 10%. And I think that was relatively, I mean, that's high. Like, let's not kid ourselves. That's like, that's, that's a booming market. That is not a normal rate of appreciation, but it, it made sense for Toronto and it didn't seem speculative. Everything was pretty normal. So I think that is normal. And, and, and now we're kind of obviously in this crazy period. The long-term rate of appreciation of houses over a long, long, like hundreds of years is about 1%. I mean, Kate, the problem with this, and like every economist says this, right? The problem with this is, you know, every economist says this is a justification to not own a home, right? They all own homes, but I mean, which is, which is the irony, right? For the record, I'm not an economist. Yeah, I know, but, but I mean, it's, I, I think the problem with this, and I think why most people looking at buying homes don't connect with, I mean, not yourself, but this economic argument that most academics make, which is it's only going up 1%, that doesn't make sense to buy a home. Yeah, certainly, when you're looking at the US as a whole, okay? Sure, if you're including the Rust Belt and everywhere else in the US, yeah, it's probably 1%. But if you're buying in, a, in, in kind of what, what we talked about, what I talked about earlier, these superstar cities, if you're in San Francisco and New York and Houston and Toronto and all of these places that are booming, well, that's not true. And, it's, and I think that's one of the problems for home buyers. They hear these stories and it's completely disconnected from what they see. And it's not yeah. just Toronto, it's everywhere else. And it's, it's and not everywhere else. Though. It is, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely most not other, everywhere It's else. most other booming urban core Sorry, cities. Did you just define the subset of cities that you're talking about yeah. with high house prices as cities that are booming? So in yeah. all of the booming cities, yeah. house prices are booming. I agree I, with you. Now, the numbers that oh, I, I had say, seen, it's in project. So. No, no, I, I, I totally I, agree with I'm you. Not, I, yeah. I didn't say all the house. I, I, my in point is, like, in, in the main urban centers, okay, yeah. in these areas that except are attracting Montreal, a lot of... Except for Montreal, except for Ottawa, except for Calgary, except for Edmonton, except for, yeah. like, hundreds of exactly. large cities they're in not, the US. They're not as supply constrained. They don't have and they're not prices. attracting as many international... Not How many people are immigrating yeah. into Montreal and Ottawa and Quebec City? And it's, and it's the not the same. Now, having, and now, having said that, I'm not going to sit here and argue that this is the best time to buy real estate. I mean, obviously, there are tensions here. And, and I think what's happening now for Torontonians, if you're buying a house because you expect your house to go up 30% next year, you're a little you know, foolish because this is a big assumption. And it is possible, but I think it's a big assumption. And I think anyone, and I, I actually agree with you, anyone who's buying a house today should factor in the assumption that they're not going to make any money like for 10 years. And, and I think we're going to this place now where people who are going to buy a house are going to buy a house for the reasons you should be buying a house. Because I work a lot. And the idea of renting a home and getting kicked out every year or two is not ideal. I want a place of my own. And, and I'm going to be there for 10 or 15 years. And I don't care if 10 or 15 years from now, in real terms, my house isn't worth that much more than it is today. I'd still be happier with my own home than if I rented. And I think that is what people should be getting to. 
So is that our survival strategy then? When we talk about surviving the market, not being so worried yeah, about retaining so that this is where I'm going to live. I'm going to be here 10, 20 years. I don't care. I remember my boss when I didn't know what I was doing in my 20s. I wanted to go buy a condo because I got married, and that's what you do, right? And then you get married, you buy someplace. And he just showed me the little thing. He goes, your house will probably do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. But if you just stay in it long enough, you're going to be all right. So that's sort of like our, <laughs> it's sort of like our fallback strategy. Some people make the plunge because that's what they want. Don't get hung up on the paper value. I'm not hung up on the fact that my house has gone up in the past 10 years because it's just on paper. What does it matter to me? My mortgage is this much. I pay this much a month. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And I, I think so. And, 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 and the key is, obviously, for most people, and I think this is the problem a lot of people have, are people overextending themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, one of my agents sent me an article, I forget what paper it was in, you know, where, where she found 81% of millennials who own property feel like they need to send it because they're overstretched financially. Okay. And this troubles me because if you feel overstretched financially, that's a decision. That's not the market. That's you not thinking about where you're going to be three years from now. I'm getting married. I'm going to have two kids. What does this cost? And you're overstretched financially. So it doesn't just happen. It's, this is like people who aren't planning and budgeting and thinking, what am I going to, be, what am I going to need five years from now? And, and can I afford this house? So I think, and think thinking about your finances is critical. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and the 1% the thing, I have a very similar view of that number <laughs> myself. Uh, what I was going to add, though, is, is to your point about these superstar cities, uh, the, the big thing, I, I think the context for Toronto is understanding uh, what happened when uh, we bought in the green belt and, and the places to grow. For anyone who follows the stock market, uh, we have three grocers in Canada. We've got Loblaws, we've got Metro, and we've got Sobeys. If one day you came into work and uh, Metro and Sobeys announced that they were closing all of their stores and they were never going to sell groceries out of those stores again, and not only that, no one else ever could either, uh, Loblaw's stock would go up about 100, maybe 200 percent that day because they would immediately have an oligopoly and the supply and demand dynamic of grocery selling would have changed absolutely dramatically. When we brought in the green belt and when we brought in uh, places to grow, that's what happened to the Canadian or the Toronto housing market. But the Toronto housing market doesn't behave the same way that the stock market does. People don't forecast forward. And so this 7% uh, compound annual growth that you saw over you know, 10 or 15 years was just really the market catching up to what should have been an overnight 40 or 50% increase in prices and then normal growth on top of that. If you decompose that 7%, I mean, interest rates came down a little bit, which improved affordability. Um, um, but the supply of housing basically stopped and population kept growing. Uh, you've got some inflation in there. And, and really, that 7% wasn't very remarkable at all. And I agree with you, this 33% is now <laughs> just pure speculative frenzy. Um, but I don't, I don't see it stopping. Okay, I'm you gonna know, give Jeff the final thought and then we're gonna open the floor to questions. You I know, there, there was no difference. green belt to blame it on in 1989. The green belt didn't even come into existence for 11, 12 years later. So maybe there are some other dynamics at play here. You know, people say, should you buy, should you rent? There's only one circumstances in which renting makes sense, and that's if you think there's going to be a big decline in housing prices. And don't forget at today's interest rates, how much of your payment goes to amortization? A lot more than in the days of 1989 when the Treasury bill was 12% and mortgages were 13 or 14%. You know, quite apart from slamming on the brakes, all asset values have their self-equilibrating mechanisms. You mentioned there's more listings. Uh, you know, we'll find an equilibrium, but it's not for Mr. Moreau to say, or no, or, or for the Polas to say, what's a targeted return for prices? What's a targeted return for the TSX? You know, what's the targeted return for the uh, Canadian fixed income market? It is what it is, and there's going to be some years where the TSX is up 25%. There's going to be some years where it's minus 10%. Why don't we just invest it in bank stock? It does have oligopoly protection, but isn't it funny how those rate, rents chase bad acquisitions in the U.S.? So maybe it isn't quite the, the safe ride it is that the uh, chartered banking system would provide. You know, I would say that at today's rates, at today's amortization schedules, the only really scenario in which it makes sense for you to rent and not buy is if you think that we're going to see an 89.90 kind of correction in housing prices. And I wouldn't argue, and I'd be the last person to argue, that that couldn't happen again. 
I'm just saying I don't see the trigger. I think that's irresponsible and dangerous advice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to buying bank stock? <laughs> Okay, oh. let's, uh, do you want to open up the floor and let sure. other people yeah, let's our, open it our up. brains up here? Um, so I'll introduce myself, Peter Gilgan, I'm the founder of a little home builder called Madame Homes. You had lunch <laughs> with uh, one of my colleagues today. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let me say, a little experience in this topic, but anyway, you talked a lot about um, laying the some of the blame at the feet of the provincial government for the uh, Places to Grow Act, etc. So, if you were going to say, and, and you guys have all talked about, wouldn't it be nice if we had a more stable market, in which we all would welcome? Um, Ten years from now, describe how you think we would introduce more stability in to the housing market here in southern Ontario. So when you, uh, when you look back at what uh, the Ontario government did uh, with the Places to Grow and the, and the Greenbelt Act, uh, I mean, green belts, I think, are a misunderstood dynamic. People think they're about the environment. They think that, uh, you know, this is, is a, you know, altruistic thing for the future. Uh, the reality is that green belts are driven by municipal budgets. Uh, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, when you had massive suburban sprawl, uh, that was at times when, uh, you know, low energy prices, uh, governments had, you know, very limited debt. And uh, so the, the plan was we're going to build all of this sprawl and, uh, and then uh, we're going to pay off all of the infrastructure by the time we need to replace the infrastructure. Uh, anyone in the investment world in the last 10 years has heard nothing but uh, massive estimates of what the uh, you know, deferred infrastructure deficit is uh, across almost every North American city. Um, so the, the green belt was really a, uh, I, I think, more of a reflection of a lack of fiscal discipline uh, within governments, uh, municipal governments as well as provincial governments. And when it was brought in, it was brought in as a stopgap solution to their inability to continue to finance low density infrastructure. Uh, but if you go back and you read all of the uh, all of the academic work on green belts that acknowledge some of this economic driver behind it, uh, every single piece that you read will say, you know, great idea. These green belts lead to more sustainable cities, less carbon footprint, all of these you know, fabulous benefits, and I agree with all of that, but every piece of research, every piece of, piece of academic study starts with one statement, and it's always, before you bring it in, invest massively in transportation infrastructure, and that is what we didn't do. If we had a high-speed rail link to Peterborough, a lot of the excess population growth and, and constraints that we have would be satisfied by housing up there. If you could get from Peterborough to Union Station in 35 minutes, uh, that would change everything. If you could get from Milton or Guelph or Hamilton to downtown Toronto, that is really the solution. And the reason that I think that uh, we're in a really bad situation, and I don't think there is a near-term solution, is building that transit infrastructure is a 10, 15, 20 year, in the case of Toronto, it's probably more like a 50 year exercise. And that's really what needs to be done to, to make it a more sustainable housing market. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm concerned. I don't know what the future holds, but you know, as I said, or alluded to earlier, up is not good, flat is not good, and down is not good. We're in a tough situation. Yeah, I think we had another one over here. Quick question. So you've been talking about the housing market as if it was a single entity, but uh, we have condos and we have uh, houses in Toronto, and I think the prices are driven by different factors. Maybe you can talk about, you know, each of you panelists can talk about that as well. Thank you. Well, some suggestion too that it was all about single family homes at first, but now it's bleeding into the other yeah. segments because you can't afford a single family home. What do you see in Yeah, I mean, it, it's. The markets, I, I'd say the condo story is probably the most interesting thing about Toronto's condo market because, I mean, this is the one segment everyone thought was just going to explode, right? I mean, you read these stories, 25, 30,000 units under construction. Um, you know, we're going to be oversupplied. They're all being bought by investors. And, and the interesting thing is the exact opposite has kind of happened. I mean, like, Right, at least in, in the short term, in the past like three, four months, it's actually been the condos that have kind of been lower in terms of supply in terms of, in, than single family homes in the resale market. And condos are booming right now. And I think it's a combination of 
you know, the, the mortgage rule changes that were put in place in November really put a lot of people who had less than 20% down out of buying a single family home. Like it's done, like you just, your budget got slashed by 20%, your only option is a condo. Uh, that combined with obviously the other factors which are, you know, demographic and people really preferring to be in the core. You know, all these stories we, we read about in different media sources of people wanting to raise family downtown, it's true. I mean, people are just preferring it to have a different lifestyle, so not commuting two hours. So, you know, I think what's happening in Toronto is, you know, and why I don't necessarily think, you know, the, the solution is more single family homes. I mean, I think when cities develop and they grow, you adjust from, you know, growing up, assuming you're going to have a detached home on a 50 foot lot to one where living in a condo is normal. And that's the way most cities are. You know, Toronto is kind of unique for a grown up city where that's not a serious option. So I think we're getting to that point now. Any more? Any I, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, anytime you make an investment in real estate, uh, you're making an investment in two things. One is the building, and the building goes down in value all the time, always, continuously, forever, with no exceptions. Always building going down in value. The only thing that can go up in value is the land, and that is depending on where the land is. If you buy land in the middle of nowhere, it might be worth nothing forever. Um, but to the extent that you have positive dynamics, you can get house, or land prices going up. Uh, so to the extent that you want to maximize your real estate investment over long periods of time, you want to maximize the percentage of the investment that you make that is represented by the land and minimize the, the building portion. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, that's an entirely separate conversation from what your personal accommodation needs are. Uh, but I would say that in the short term, definitely, I mean, we had a surge of completions in condominiums last year. Uh, the market got a little bit spooked by the magnitude, uh, worried that it wouldn't get absorbed, got absorbed just like that. And now there's actually a shortage in the pipeline. Uh, so, you know, I think we saw 11% uh, condo rent increase in the last 12 months which is huge um, and was unexpected. But I expect that you'll probably see that for the next year or two um, as we continue to have a shortage. It's a shortage of aggregate housing in the, in the shorter term. In the longer term, the only way that we can satisfy the demand for more accommodation in, in Toronto, absent some significant policy, policy changes, is just more high rise. So um, supply and demand, you're gonna see a lot more supply of condos um, and single family homes in the, in the GTA are, you know, almost tapped out. I mean, as a percentage of the whole, there might be another 3% or 4% supply increase. And then if we don't have policy change, that's all the single family homes that we'll have. Right, we have, one more. I think we have time, time for one more. I'm going to I'm gonna quick, on, I'm gonna quick one comment on the, the earlier question, because I think it's really interesting. The first question about what, what we do 10 years from now to cool the market or to manage it. I was in uh, Dubai about two months ago to look at how their government manages the real estate sector. And obviously my role coming from Canada was, okay, what can they learn from developed countries to do? And while there were a lot of things, you know, we were able to tell them, me and my counterpart, that they can improve on, it was fascinating because we went there and because their market is so new, they're doing things that we don't do here. Uh, and what I mean by that is they have so much information about what is going on in their market they can introduce policies instantly to change it. So every new construction property is registered on their land registry system. It cannot be assigned without people paying taxes. People cannot, fl if people start flipping properties in short periods of time, they track it and will instantly introduce a speculation tax if more than say 10% of people are flipping homes. So they have so much data uh, at their fingertips and are really able to manage it. And I think that's one of the problems we keep hearing about in Canada. Just yeah, we, no either we don't have the data or no one's willing yeah. to actually collect it and tell the truth about it. I think time for one more question. Before. Uh, you mentioned Toronto as an international destination and uh, attracting uh, foreign speculation. And you also brought up that flexibility in foreign countries to adapt with the housing market. So in that context, how effective is uh, the conversations around the foreign tax? Uh, being discussed, taxing the foreign buyers at 10% and following the Vancouver model? I think it's polit politically expedient. I don't think it, I don't think it'll have much of an impact. Uh, I think people can get around it. I think there's lots of domestic speculators. John would probably be able to talk to that better. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, see, the, I mean, the foreign buyers are a bit of a scapegoat. I mean, of course, there is a lot of foreign uh, speculation and investment. 
I think domestic is probably higher. Uh, and I think these rules they put in place are really just to make it look like the government's doing something uh, when they're really not. I mean, there, there's so many loopholes. The only person who really qualifies to kind of actually pay this tax is someone who literally has no connection to Canada, you know, puts their finger on the map about where they want to drop a million dollars to invest and chooses Toronto, right? Like, that's kind of the only person who's going to have to pay that tax because, you know, if you have a kid here who's going to university for a year, well, you can now invest if you're, you know, uh, here on a part-time one-year contract, you can invest. So it's not going to have a big impact. Like I said, all this slowdown, I think, is just psychological because people are worried sales are going to drop 40% the way they did in Vancouver. Jeff, I'm curious. Who, who were we blaming in 1988 when house, house prices were running up? I wasn't paying attention. I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we were blaming speculators at the time. Uh, we were blaming people flipping houses, and all of that was happening. But at the end, uh, we blamed the Bank of Canada. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, I think that for many years, uh, the real estate industry and financial institutions that were lending to the real estate industry was materially impacted. I think credit for real realtors there was a quantum change there. And I don't think that financial institutions, not just trust companies, but banks, just like in 2007, never realized in the US that there could be a real estate correction of this magnitude. And hence, you know, did not engineer their due diligence to accommodate that. And when that happened, huge financial fallout. I'm not personally, so convinced that there'd be any less financial fallout on lending institutions if we replayed 1989-1990. But again, as I've argued, you know, there were special circumstances that pricked that bubble. Maybe President, you know, the Trump agenda will provide the circumstances for a whole resetting of interest rates, and then, you know, then there is a real risk. But I think the lesson from 89-90 was basically that both the industry and the lending institutions were unprepared for the severity of the price shock that, that occurred. Well, we could talk about this all night, obviously, but I want to thank the three gentlemen for making my, uh, my job so easy. I just sat back and listened. Thank you. So we, uh, we've hosted over 20 events at the Empire Club this season, and I can say without reserve that that was one of the best discussions we've had. So another round of applause for our panelists and our moderator. <laughs> it's my pleasure to invite Derek uh, back up to officially thank our panelists and just a bit of housekeeping while Derek's making his way uh, to the front of the room. Uh, so please stick around. Uh, the bar will be open. There's lots of food to go around. And uh, we have our next event is on May the 5th. It's a lunch event, it's not an evening event, and it's with the new CEO of the ROM and the AGO together talking about our cultural institution. So we like to mix it up at the Empire Club and provide a lot of different types of events. So, Derek? Thanks so much, and gentlemen, that was great. I mean, I think, I think the one piece I would add to all that discussion is really just about, you know, when you're thinking about buying or anything that you're doing, now more than ever before, uh, clients need advice, and they need to sit with a professional who understands the market, can provide very educated advice, and move at the speed of the market. And that's something that RBC is great at, and that's why you know we've become the leading trusted brand in Canada, and something that I would highly encourage all of you, if anyone's thinking about buying, don't look at the CIBC guy. <laughs> But uh, no, and, and, and I mean, another great brand. I, I, for me, it's about advice and, and sitting with, with your bank and talking about these scenarios is more important now than ever before uh, because there's just so much discussion about it and so much uncertainty. And in certain, in certain cases, when you have the advice and you're working with the numbers, you get a better understanding of what's possible, what's doable, and what the future looks like. And so anyway, we were just really pleased to be a part of the event tonight and look forward to chatting with others uh, afterwards. And again, great discussion, gentlemen. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, everybody.